So we'll just get on with the day. Yo! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We're rolling. We got a little docket of uh, reflection. We had uh, a yeah. last week's episode was with Brett Walishka, um, a guy that I've been working with for about three years in his off season. Um, and just, I don't know, I, I was really impressed in how he approached his recovery from his different injuries over the season. And it kind of got my mind running a little bit, thinking about that stuff. And then also um, this past weekend before this recording was the Canadian Senior Nationals for weightlifting. And uh, Kayla was an invite for the BC weightlifting team because she still has her BC card. She doesn't have an Ontario card. Um, And since she did most of her qualifiers in BC, she was eligible to lift for Team BC. So she got an invite. And I'll tell the story on why that happened and all that all that jazz once we get there i guess and then um i think that's going to kind of snowball just into the athlete mindset and how far that can go into somebody's life i don't think it's like like youth athletes um aside from like the general health focus i think it should be in um what they gain in terms of like social structure with with teammates and friends and all that, but just, just mindset of overcoming what could be perceived as a setback or challenge and kind of, it's always just an opportunity for something else. And I think that's exactly what Brett said. Yeah. That was interesting. Convo. I yeah. actually never really, like, especially when we were talking about the, the concussion stuff, I'd never really heard someone put it that way, mm-hmm. which, yeah, I thought was pretty cool. Cause I mean, I obviously read about this all the time, like what can you do after concussion so on and so forth. And it's one thing to like put that out there to athletes, but again, injuries are tough and this is probably the hardest one. And just to kind of hear like the practical stuff um, or like literally kind of the steps going through your mind, how you deal with that actually in the moment, in the situation when you're playing sports. Yeah. It was pretty cool. I thought that was interesting. Yeah. And then like a great example of like you mentioned, just mindset from an athlete perspective and how that might be different from other people. Yeah. It was just like, there was a sense of like tenacity, like right away. He was like, we never, it's seemingly or outwardly, at least how he communicated, communicated it to us is that there was never a moment where he was like feeling bad for himself. Um, frustrated for sure. Yeah. Um, especially with how his season went, he was going up and down, um, between leagues and the injuries. Um, obviously had a big part to play in that up and down portion because it's a, in a league, like in the leagues that he's playing in every single game, you're fighting for your spot. Then you're also fighting for the spot to jump up when the opportunity comes up. If somebody drops down or gets hurt or something on the next level. So it's not like you just, you're not getting, you're not comfy. You're not making five million a year. Yeah, I was going to say, it's not like the money's amazing either. Like yeah. it's, I mean, especially in the coast, it's, it's, <laughs> It's nothing to really write home about. Yeah. Like you said, you are you are 100% there to grind it out and try and move up. It's not really something where players stay or, like, make it a goal to, like, stay in something like the, the right. East Coast. It's a stepping stone. Yeah, Brett's goal isn't to stay there and play a career in the East. Yeah. Yeah, He's, he wants to get out of there um, as soon as possible. I mean, and I didn't realize his schedule was that – crazy i knew there was a lot of games but i I didn't know the uh conditions of the travel and all that too um but yeah i i really like to i guess from like an injury standpoint i hear so many different conversations about that in say a month maybe because it doesn't come up that often but maybe there'll be a couple conversations i have a month of somebody who has uh injured and I'm using my hand quotations right now injured themselves because there's always it's like are you hurt or are you injured are you sore or are you hurt and it's like there's different levels to this it's not like so Brent's head injury or Brett sorry fuck <laughs> he's gonna be pissed about that <laughs> Brett's head injury well, we don't know which one you mean <laughs> is uh judge. that that's an injury um especially when you're talking about your brain I mean you're the brain guy, you know, 
all the ins and outs there. It's just, it's such a fragile and obviously necessary organ to take care of. Yeah. And when something's not working in there, it's a I, big problem. I gave a presentation in the past couple of weeks at two different hockey teams on this. Um, so this is our, both Jesse and I are providing services for this elite spring hockey program Boys and girls teams, the age range is, what is it? It's like 04 birth year, right? 2004 birth year. Yeah, yeah. Sounds funny. Because <laughs> yeah. the big saying used to be like, you, people kind of ask how old you are when you're growing up and you always just say the birth year. Like, oh, I'm a 91, I'm a 93, yada, yada, yada. Now it's, it just sounds funny now hearing it. Kids are going to be like, yeah, I'm a 10, I'm 11. <laughs> yeah. But they probably think ours sound <clears throat> funny. Ancient. So, yeah. So where I was going with that was, it's just funny trying to give this presentation to young kids of that age, trying to explain to them, like, not a lot about what's going on because that's, I mean, they're not going to pay attention or care. So I don't get into a lot of that. But even, like, you know, why you have to take this seriously, what you can do before, what you can do after, and so on and so forth. And 100% the boys were not nearly as into it as the girls like just no comparison which yeah. i'm not surprised about it's just kind of <clears throat> i don't i i say funny because it's their kids right they're and they're young boys like yeah. just off the chain all they want to do is play hockey you know have fun and so on and so forth but it's just interesting to see kind of how perspectives and opinions on that change from like such a young age to a even someone like Brett, who is in their like literally in their exact same position, no, no more than ten years ago, right? Like, yeah. So it, it doesn't take <laughs> yeah. long to switch that mindset, but for sure you have that that kind of not caring mindset for a long period of time. Yeah, the bro phase for sure. Yeah. You can you can see it and feel it when you walk into the room. <laughs> it's funny how the uh, I'm. This is a generalization, but. Um, the track record shows for me when I work with young athletes of the same age around that age range, it's like the girls in terms of movement, strength, and maturity are like leaps and bounds yeah. ahead of the guys all the time. The girls is like just rocking and they're strong. They move well, understand how their bodies work. And then, um, yeah, the guys, I think it's just, just a debacle half the time to get them going. <laughs> it's pretty funny. But yeah, I mean, like, I think the, the big thing for Brett's recovery and was his mindset. And I don't like, we we've talked about this before with the placebo effect in terms of like, just being motivated to go to the gym. We were talking about like yeah. regular Joe's like your attitude when you, when you approach the gym, like approach the front doors, I mean, um, right. to when you approach your barbell or you approach your, your setup for the wad or whatever you're doing, um, has a drastic impact on your, performance first and then second to that which was really surprising is when you talked about the results that that people can get just by changing their mindset yeah saying that this is like being positive and this is good and i kind of gave a couple people shit a couple weeks ago at west london because it was just like a it was an eeyore class i call it it's like a bunch of old (laughs) bothers you know and it's like i'm looking around i'm like i'm seeing a group of very able-bodied people who have potential to do great things in this one hour. And we just spent 15 minutes going, Oh bother. Right. So I kind of like didn't really stop the class, but I was like, I have a tendency to have like passive aggressive jokes sometimes. Yeah. So I was trying to keep it light and breezy. Um, But at the same time, it kind of kickstarted them a little bit and doesn't take much. It's just like reminding people that like your, your attitude when you're doing anything is, is everything in, in yeah. what you get out of it. And that is super cheesy and I hate it, but it's true. Yeah. And I think they'd be, I would think people would be grateful that you did something like that in the end. Anyways, maybe at the time they, I don't know everyone reacts differently, but maybe in the heat of the moment, they aren't too pleased, but I'm sure at the end of the night when they go home, they probably thought back on it and said, yeah, you know, I'm happy you said something. Cause then I actually, made my hour worth it and didn't yeah. just piss around and waste it away. <clears throat> um, I was going to say, yeah, uh, it's funny. Like in a sense, you could almost say like 
half of your life is placebo. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know, really. If you just think about it, just how big your mindset is, right? Like, just just think about your day to day actions. Like, if you think, you know, if you think you have a good morning routine and you think it makes you feel good, regardless of what you're doing, and I'm not talking about just healthier, but health as well, then you know that could set you on the right path for the day. Um, mm-hmm. Same thing, like when you're at work, if you think you're doing a good job, that's going to kind of re-motivate you, reinvigorate you and kind of keep you going, push you forward. I think you could break like, I just think you could break like a thousand million different situations down like that and just kind of pick it apart and say, like, if you have a positive mindset on this, then it's just going to kind of, it's just going to trigger that domino effect. And yeah, so I don't know what you're saying. Yeah. So I guess maybe you wouldn't call that placebo necessarily because i know placebo is more like okay we're using treatment a and we're getting like effect a or b whatever right, something right. like that but still like there's no denying what a positive mindset can do yeah for sure it's almost like creating a purpose to what you're doing um so that you're a little bit more we talked about it a couple of weeks ago the motivation thing like if you can apply a purpose to what you're doing you're going to be more motivated to do it um, because there's more on the line. It's like, okay, if I do A, I'm going to get B out of it. And if I don't do that, then I don't get that positive outcome or whatever it is. And uh, I think uh, the, the part that I struggled with early on when I was coaching with like calling people out on their, on their shit a little bit was that I, I didn't feel that it was very caring to do that. And in fact, it's the complete opposite. Like I found that I was trying to be like empathetic with people. So when people would come into the gym and say, oh, I had, uh, or just not feeling it, you know, that's kind of people that say, uh, they're like, ah, yeah, I'm here. I'm just here. I'm do- going through the motions. I'm here. Um, not really feeling it today. And I would be like, oh, okay. Sorry. You feel that way. And like, you know, yeah. what's going on. And all I would do is like push them further down that rabbit hole by asking them, about that thing when really when it came down to it it wasn't anything it was just their mindset that day yeah their approach to everything yeah they were just slumping reason. yeah they were being an eeyore all day yeah. long um so me pushing them further down the rabbit hole that way didn't help them any so now i i just kind of flipped my own mindset to being like if i actually want to be empathetic towards this person i need to challenge them and and bring them up a level and that's more supportive than the opposite. I think too many times, and, and you can tell uh, just by your, your social cir- circle probably, like if, if a lot of your friends are like that, then you're probably like that. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah, definitely. Because you're searching that out in people that you yeah. associate with and hang out with. Um, that can be a little uncomfortable exercise yeah. to do with yourself. There's definitely but, a lot of truth to that yeah. saying. How's that going now? you're the combination of the five people you hang out most with. There's something right, like that. Yeah, you're, yeah. Uh, you're a product of the five people you hang out most with. Something yeah, like that. absolutely. Yeah. I thought that was always a good saying. I agree with that. Yeah, totally. Uh, and uh, going back to Brett, let's talk about uh, his, his thing. So like what I really liked is that instead of finding the 100 things that were wrong at that time, um, his questions of, am I going to get sent down again? Am I going back up? Like, where am I going to be living? Where's, you know, my girlfriend, how's my family thinking? What do people think of me? Um, where am I going to be next year? Like all those racing questions that I'm sure cross his mind, but it's almost like a mindfulness thing where he could like process that thought and then be like, okay, and let it go. And the way that he was able to do that was to find the thing that he could do. So now he doesn't have to worry about all these things that are out of his control because he has this one thing that he could control. So he talked about like just he wasn't on the screens or anything like that, which is probably a a good call. Yeah. But he was exercising his mind by like playing with a ball, juggling like low difficulty things for him. Just like getting his hand eye back, getting his focus back, moving his eyes around a little bit all the things that you got to go really slow with in the initial recovery from a concussion. Um, But he pushed it there and he, he found things that he could do and you let go of the things that were out of his control. And then that gives you, that gives you a lot of freedom when you do that, because now you're in control again, instead of your injury being in control. 
And I think too many people would go down the route of, uh, oh, I'm concussed and like start identifying as the injury. Just like if somebody, so Kayla's example, like, oh, I have a broken elbow. She was like the broken elbow athlete. It's like, well, that's as good as you're going to get. You're the broken elbow athlete and you can't do X, Y, Z. Um, but you flip it the other side and it's like, I can do this and I'm going to get back on the ice or I'm going to get back on the platform or I'm going to get back on the floor or whatever your sport is. It's a freeing sort of feeling and, and gives you some sort of purpose again because athletes. I, That's a good point. Yeah. 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 I think in the end it could maybe end up being quite often. It could be a blessing in disguise. I think, like especially if I don't know, just kind of sticking with the athlete perspective Maybe if you have a bunch of things that you are um, neglecting and putting off for a very long period of time that you 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 knew about, but kind of in the back of your mind, you just kind of you know kept shrugging it off, shrugging it off. Whether that be, yeah. I don't know, this could be this this is very abstract, but it could be a number of different things. Like if you're an athlete and your maybe your nutrition isn't on point, you don't put any time into mobility. Maybe you know your sleep is crap for. Um, reasons that you're aware of or maybe you're being a bad teammate you know like whatever it could be any number of things mm -hmm. and then once you get injured I think what that can create is you mentioned like it kind of shifts the perspective but also I think it for whatever reason it, it forces you to definitely sit down and do a little bit of um, I don't want to call it like self-reflection basically and then yeah. you think back like i I think one question that probably goes through everyone's mind is why did this happen? Like, why did I get hurt? And right. more often than not, there's probably no reason at all, but regardless, just from going through that process, I think you pick apart different aspects and then you probably immediately go to these, go to these other things that you know, you have been neglecting and say, you know what, like whether this is, whether this had anything to do with the injury or not, I will never know, but I think there's a chance regardless i want to improve these things because i know that they're impairing me in the long run anyways regardless of the injury yeah so kind totally. of and like if that if that injury didn't happen like who knows who knows if you would have ever you know actually kind of backed off a little bit slowed things down zoomed out took that like kind of helicopter perspective and said okay i actually need to kind of slow things down fix these other areas and then in the end i'm going to become better from that and this is all just this is all just, it's perspective, right? right. Like it's, I mean, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's especially if you're a competitive athlete, like you're now going to have hours in your day that are now freed up that too. Yeah. Right. Because it, yeah. it, like for Brett, he has concussion. So physical stuff is, is out for him. Right. So time to focus on like more stretching that he talked about and, and that sort of thing. Um, yeah. I, so it's just using that time that, you have freed up for something productive instead of just wallowing and uh, feeling sorry for yourself, which is maybe part of the process too, but like, don't take too long, yeah. you know, take a day, take a weekend, you know, go away a little bit, like hang out with your friends, do something different just to like get your mind somewhere else. And then yeah. you got to get back to it though. Otherwise you're just not an athlete. And then you got to come to terms with that too. Right. Like yeah. you're just soft and you're not going to make it. And that's, that can be a tough realization too, but some people are just soft and they're not going to make it. It's not for everybody. <laughs> it's, it's really not. Um, I think this is actually, there's many benefits to podcasts nowadays, but I think this in particular, and it doesn't just have to be our podcast. I hope <laughs> it's your first choice, but if it's not, is um, if you are in that stage of, and I don't even think this has to just apply to injuries, but injuries, especially if you're feeling a little stuck, maybe you're in those initial stages of um, whatever, like feeling sorry for yourself. I think that's where something like a podcast can really, really help because especially if you, um, I don't know, for some reason you, your day job, you're not around a lot of people or around a lot of like-minded people, I guess I should say. So like other athletes, yeah. is I think a podcast could really come in handy then. You know, you flip on some some podcasts where you listen to other athletes speak and they tell their story about this exact same scenario, basically. And totally. sometimes that's all it takes to just kind of, you know, click things and then you say, oh, shit, like, 
you know, I'm not the only one here. Like people go through this all the time. This person I'm listening to right now mentioned and explained how they use this as actually a stepping stone to get better in the long run. So I'm going to do that too. And then you just kind of be on your merry way. Right. Yeah. I don't know if you do that yourself, but just I've not even consciously have done it, but as you're saying that it's like all, so for coaching, for example, if I feel like, um, in a little bit of a lull or something, or I need some motivation in hand quotations yeah. again to like get down to work. Um, I'll throw on podcasts of my favorite coaches. So it's Mike Fitzgerald, James Fitzgerald. Yeah. Um, I really like um, the brute strength podcast as well. Cause there's a lot of mindset stuff and things like that in there. Yeah. And just after 15 minutes of listening, it's like, okay, let's get yeah, it. To, no, let's I, get it together. I totally now. Agree. Yeah. yeah. It, and it's cool how accessible it is. It's like on your phone, it's on your laptop, two it's seconds, whatever, yeah. two seconds or your headphones in if you're in a, in a yeah. coffee shop or something, the way you go goes a long way for sure i don't even listen to the radio anymore it's yeah like if i'm 99 percent of the time if i'm driving somewhere that's longer than 30 minutes like it's podcast or nothing it's just so much information out there and it's in perspective. perspective we had this conversation the other i don't know like before one of our previous recordings i just go get so sick of hearing i guess just about day-to-day problems and day-to-day news oh, just yeah. news just in general because it's so talk. fucking negative right yeah. and yeah most of the time even the stories they're telling on the radio like if they're not necessarily referring to news it's more often than not like you know, these negative stories just about literally just about day-to-day bullshit and i yeah. just i don't know i just personally if you if people like the radio i don't I have no problem with that. I just personally don't really enjoy it. And like you said, like you only have so much room to store information. And I've actually found this from experience is that, so I say I listen to a lot of podcasts, but compared to what I used to listen to, it's probably like 10%. Like I used to just over consume them like way too much yeah. and like make a goal to, you know, like today I have to listen to another podcast. That's all my to-do list. Like I have to learn about this, that, and this. And after a while, I just felt like it was way too much. I wasn't really retaining as much as I would like. And I've one thing I've come back to now, which I've found massive benefit from is actually just revisiting old stuff. Because yeah. that's like, that's, it's basically new information, right? Like a lot of the times, if you hear something on a podcast and, I mean, this is if you take notes, you don't have to, but I used to do this a lot too, just because the things I was learning about, I, I loved and I wanted to retain and learn more about. Um, and actually all this, the first times that I ever did this, like when I started listening to podcasts, when I read my first book, when I was like 22 or 23, this was when I got injured playing hockey and I was like, fuck, I need to do something with myself. Yeah. <clears throat> I have a full course load at school, but I'm absolutely bored out of my mind because I have an extra 10 hours a day. <laughs> yeah. So anyways, this was, yeah, just over consuming. But I found that over time, like if I just come back and reread those notes, it's like new information. But at the same time, it's it's far easier to retain and apply than it is with like actual new information that you've never ever heard before because it's it's like i don't know it's the same idea as if you like revisit it's i mean it's a little bit different technically in terms of like different types of memory but if you revisit like a town that you haven't been to in say five ten years you have no idea until you get to that town and then you recognize kind of the streets and oh i know how to get here i know how to get there and like it's it's same idea different types of memory but it's, it's a new memory, but it's not really like it was there all along and you're just kind of re-sparking that. Um, Charles Poliquin was massive on this too, who he's gone now, but for the listeners who don't know, he was um, like massive influential figure in health and nutrition industry. Um, even I often go back and read a, reread a lot of his stuff still, like even just his blog posts. And it's amazing to see how far ahead of like the curve he was. Mm -hmm. So when we had that podcast on xenoestrogens, like estrogen detox and so on and so forth. So this is something that seems to be popping up more and more in the last like two, three years, but you can go back on his website and look up posts about xenoestrogens from like 
I don't know, I swear it's like five to 10 years ago and it's literally like everything that you're seeing now, like p- things that people are saying now, like citing papers, so on and so forth. He, he just had that right there on his blog. Like just here's so the protocol. Ahead. This is why. Yeah. Like he was, he was <clears throat> nuts and he, he spoke like, five or six different languages, I think. Oh, wow. Like, he was a maniac. I don't know if you... So, his story about why he started learning languages in the first place was because... So, again, he he died recently. He was probably, like... He was pretty young, actually, like 60 or 65, I think. Like, I think he had some genetic heart problems, but he started learning other languages in the first place because internet not really accessible at that point in time. Um, but he wanted to learn more about all these other training principles that were going on throughout the world. So like German periodization, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Well, the only way to learn about those was to read about them and they're only published in German. So he would learn these other languages so that he (laughs) could read these fucking books to learn about fitness, like paradigms and whatnot. Um, so where was I going with that? Yeah. So he was big on having notes, but instead of just constantly crushing new info is revisiting the stuff you've already learned. So I, he would do something like, I think he would review his notes that he had from that week, like every Sunday or something like that. So a lot of cool, a lot of cool, um, kind of perspective content from him alongside the, the Bible health and nutrition stuff. So yeah, that one I really, really liked. Yeah. All those like masters of anything are always so interesting to me because yeah, it just say it takes so much time and practice all the, like you you have to be practicing your craft every single day like almost all day in order to get better yeah like it it's just that's what makes you the best of the best and that's why i mean that sort of diligence that he had to like make notes review the notes <laughs> learn other languages to expand his knowledge in other countries outside of the united states he's american right he was canadian he's canadian yeah so outside of canada north america and like just yeah yeah that's that's next the language level. thing alone is amazing to me so cool like, yeah 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 the sort of mastery is just an anomaly yeah. it's it's pretty awesome i think like there aren't very many people like that like paul check would be another one that comes yeah to that's a good example yeah um but i think james fitzgerald is close to that i don't think he would say that he is um, how old is he uh forties in his so 40s. he's yeah so he's like it takes time right I'm sure in 10 15 years he'll probably be there like, yeah to that level right I remember talking to him when I was at the life coaching seminar in Scottsdale at OPEX headquarters and it was the most challenging conversation I've ever had in my life because there's no no bullshit that slips through right any um so I know I like to say uh, a lot of people or like some people will do, and he'll be like, well, who? Right. And it, yeah. it's a challenging every single generalization that somebody makes until it's refined down to the actual stuff that matters. And then that's a whole conversation, but it's so intimidating. Oh my yeah. God. So when that, people are like that, they're so intense and so like deliberate in their, even just a, I don't mean shit to him. He won't remember who I am, but he took so much time in that five minute conversation to like boil it down to exactly what I was trying to tell him. Yeah. And then he gave me feedback on that directly. That's cool. And it was like the most incredible five minute conversation of my life. It was pretty cool. So is that along the lines of, um, fuck, I'm trying to remember this other saying it some it goes something like, say what you mean and mean what you say or something oh, yeah. like that. Yeah, I would it, say so big on sure. that. Yeah. I would say so. Yeah, it was, like that one too. Um, and if you listen to a, a lot of people don't let, like to listen to his podcast because, uh, or ones that he's a guest on. Cause he like, he's really, he's a challenging conversation yeah. to have, but, um, that's how you become a master of what you're doing. It's like you're questioning everything to get down to the truth right, or what yeah. you perceive to be the truth. And if you just accept what people say on a whim and be like, yeah, okay, that sounds good then it's, you can't sort through all the bullshit and find the stuff that actually matters. Yeah. Which is, I mean, those are some, this day and age in a time with social media, all the information we're constantly exposed to. I think having those tools is more important than ever. Yeah. You got to sort through. Yeah. 
All right, let's uh, we'll loop her back. We'll get off our uh, right. Her, we've had some good tangents lately, though. Yeah, it's good. I so, like you know, it. some people when we get feedback, they literally just say, "I can't wait to listen to the next tangent." Like, <laughs> like what's this week's tangent? Or whatever. Yeah, you never know where it's gonna go. I want to brag about Kayla for a little while here. Yeah, I just want to talk about uh, because I think it's. Um, it's a good example. It's an incredible example of what an athlete is. Um, and we got a sense of that. If you listen to last week's episode, we got, you got an example hearing Brett talk for himself about himself. You hear his perspective and his mindset and his approach. Um, so I'm going to go at this from like, and it's cool for me because this is a situation where I'm not the coach or the athlete in this situation. I'm just, I'm a essentially a bystander and just witnessing this happen around me. And try not to be too involved because um, that's not my job. Like my job is just to to be there and support basically in in this situation, I think. I don't know. Um, So quick rundown, like December 6th, let's say, early December. um, Kayla was at Provincials, Junior Provincials for weightlifting. She needed to hit uh, 150 kilo total to qualify for nationals. So she goes through her snatches. I think she missed one, missed her first one, hit her next two, put herself in a position where she'd have to PR her clean and jerk in that portion of the competition in order to qualify for nationals with a 150 kilo total. So First two lifts go great. Clean and jerk is definitely her most more consistent lift over snatches. Snatches for her, um, a little bit more nervous about. And, and clean and jerks, it's like she's one of those uh, athletes or one of those weightlifters that, like, if you can clean it, she, if she can squat it, she's going to put it overhead. It's not a problem. Which is, isn't that kind of like a rule of, like, if I've, I've heard this from – legit Olympic weightlifting coaches before where it's like, like it is a sin if you can clean that up and can't get it overhead. And to me, I am the exact opposite. <laughs> me too. It's like, yeah. <laughs> I have no problem getting this up. Probably not going up overhead. Yeah, <laughs> totally. I, t- I totally so. agree with that. Yeah. But I think you're right in the sense that like from a, a weightlifting standpoint, like if you're a weightlifter, if you, yeah. if you clean it, you better be putting it overhead or else quit. So I, I don't want to derail you here too much, but if you ever watch, um, that Jared Enderton guy is a great example. Oh, like, yeah. So a guy from CrossFit Games, he I think he won that like the speed uh, speed clean and jerk ladder from last year, I believe. Yeah, he's a beast. If you ever watch someone like that do a jerk overhead, like it is insane. It's like there's there's like no movement. Like they there's hardly any dip. There's hard like it's a it's amazing to me how they're able to get that overhead with such yeah. like minimal total movement. It's yeah, the, it's like the bar doesn't move; they go under it. Yeah, right? it's like a little tiny, po- and it's four hundred pounds. That's the thing. Yeah, and he's like, doing it's absurd. it absurd, like touch and go. Like I'm <laughs> using the balance from receiving my clean to put this up overhead. Yeah, yeah. At that point, is there's so much like physics involved with like the whip of the barbell yeah. and the timing of the dip and drive and all that stuff. That's like next level thinking. Yeah, that's um, it's yeah, it's incredible. Just watch any of the, like the world record clean and jerks, and like on the jerk, the bar. Yeah. doesn't move they're getting down underneath that thing yeah. as fast as possible but yeah that's like that's a i think that's a number one rule for cleaning jerks like you you best be at least trying to put it up over your head damn it so uh yeah your first two clean jerks go great um and then it's uh time to send it right it's like you gotta she's gotta go for it uh hits the clean so watching i'm like game over Right, she did it. She's gonna jerk this, no problem. And there you go. You qualify for nationals, right on the button, 150 kilo total. Mm-hmm. Away you go. Now, keep in mind, just to make it a little bit more of a story, I'm sitting between her grandparents when this is happening. Oh. I got grandma on the one side and grandpa on the other side. So we're chilling, we're watching. They have no idea really what's going on. So I'm trying to like explain to them as this is going on, um, what's happening. They were all confused why she only lifted three times and the orders all over the place. It just, it was, it was fun. <laughs> so she goes for the jerk, hits it, right? Lockout. As she's recovering her feet, um, 
her back foot doesn't quite, I think it was her back foot doesn't quite make it all the way up. So she doesn't get the down signal. So now she's kind of stumbling a little bit, holding the bar overhead, trying to get her feet back together so that she can get the down signal. As she does that, she overcompensates and then dumps it off to her right side a little bit. And as a consequence of this whole thing, her elbow um, kind of went a little soft and then ended up with an avulsion fracture in her right elbow. So obviously really disappointing for multiple reasons. Like that's, that's the lift you got to hit. And uh, I mean, in CrossFit, <laughs> CrossFit weightlifting, she hit it. And, uh, but it, I mean, rules are rules and you got You got to hit the standards and all that stuff. Right. So was it like an immediate, um, like that's definitely a busted elbow or was this like an after the fact thing? Like, Hey, I think my elbow's really boned. Watching it. You couldn't tell what it was that hurt. Cause she kind of crumbled and the bar kind of hit her. So she was laying on the ground and me watching, I'm like, I'm not sure if she's just hurt because the bar hit her and it's like scary or like it bruised her arm because it kind of like came down and hit her side a little bit and then she ended up on the ground. So you, you know she's hurt, but it's hard to tell if it's like a scary thing or she's just kind of hurt or she's injured, like it yeah. ended up being an injury. Um, so they go through the whole deal, whatever, go to the hospital, got an avulsion fracture in the right elbow. Um, so you can only imagine for her how like dejected she feels. It's like, this was, um, her final junior, uh, competition. Um, she's trying to qualify for senior nationals and she had almost done it. So there's a, a bunch of thoughts. I'm sure that was going through her head. Obviously she was really emotional afterwards and it didn't help that the guy that was helping her, um, with like getting the sling on was a complete douche, but that doesn't really matter anymore. Um, just a, a tip. If you're working with an athlete and you think that they've hurt themselves, don't tell them that they're not going to be able to lift for a year, like 10 minutes after they get hurt. Maybe just shut your mouth and wait a little bit Classic. or maybe do. Cause maybe subconsciously that's what motivated Kale to get back yeah. out there and just to prove that guy wrong. But there were some dumb things said. Um, so, after that, similar to what Brett did, right? Brett's like, hey, well, what can I do? So after a couple of days of being upset, they put her in a cast too at the hospital. I left that part out. Fortunately, when she went to the physio, they're like, let's get this thing off of you because they knew that Kayla wanted to get back and competing as soon as possible. Um, so they got the cast off and she started being able to move it a little bit. But um, So the avulsion fracture, basically your ligament pulls a piece of bone off. So you lose some structural integrity on the inside of your elbow. Um, like your, your main bones, like the, the humerus, all then radiate, like they weren't uh, broken. It's a ligament pulls off a piece of the bone is an avulsion fracture. So um, after a couple of days, it's like she's talking to her coach who's, who is programming for her at the time. And it's like, well, he can squat. So let's get squatting. Right. And, uh, I mean, for Kayla being a weightlifter who, um, her cleans the limiter on a clean and jerk when hurt, get the leg strength up a little bit. Right. So it's just an opportunity to get better. And that's the difference. It wasn't, Oh, I have a broken elbow, so I can't go to the gym. And you hear that. Oh, my thumb's sore. My wrist is sore. It's like, I don't give a fuck, man. Like, what can you do? And let's focus on that. Now there's an exception thing, right? I'm talking about an athlete. I'm not talking about the everyday gym goer. Obviously, if you don't have competitive aspirations or you don't, you're not going to make any money off of this or anything like that, like you got to kind of, you got to weigh your pros and cons and decide maybe this yeah. is an opportunity to work on the things that you said, like diet, um, sleeping patterns, unhealthy habits, like smoking, trying to quit that or um, cutting back on sugar or something like that. Maybe that's a better approach for your overall health than trying to battle it out in the gym. But if you're an athlete, your goal is to get back to competing as soon as possible. And that wasn't really supported by the doctors and stuff, which is really disappointing because they, it's always like, <clears throat> it's almost like if they, they've worked with people that don't want to get better for so long that they're just used to talking negative. They're like, oh, well, maybe not. I probably shouldn't do that. Probably shouldn't do this. And it's like, I get it. There's a, a standard of cares that they need to take care of and all that stuff. But you're, you're talking to somebody who wants to get better. So let's talk about how to get better. Let's not talk about what's wrong yeah. too much. Right. Um, so right away, she got back on and started squatting. Fast forward uh, six months later because, I mean, it's uh, 
between December and this past weekend, it's nothing but boring hard work, basically, right? It's tracking your food. It's um, not missing a session, even when you don't feel like it. It's doing your bicep curls and your tricep extensions <laughs> to try to get your elbow strength back. Like it's all the little boring things that she did in order to get herself eligible. Um, her coach from BC guy um, is a gangster and Kale is young in the sport. Like she has a lot of years ahead of her in competing if she wants to. So um, it was a great opportunity. So again, just a reminder that she was three kilos short of her qualifying total. So she had to get invited. So fortunately there was two spots on the BC team up for grabs and guy really pulled for Kale to get one of those spots so that she could go nice. and get this experience. So um, it worked out. She got the experience. So we went to La Prairie just outside of uh, Montreal this past weekend and she competed. She went six for six, didn't miss a single lift. Um, and I think like there's, this is why everyone, I, I truly think that everyone should have something that they're really passionate about. It doesn't have to be sports. It could be your career. It could be knitting. It could be pottery. It could be whatever, but there's very few things that can bring somebody the amount of joy that I saw on Kayla's face when she hit her last clean and jerk. Like she started crying on the platform right away. I can think of one other situation in my life where I've seen somebody that happiness when my mom got her teaching job at Fanshawe. We were on vacation and she got off the phone and just started bawling. And that's not because that moment is so special. It's because they're so proud of themselves for working their ass off to get to that point when so many people, if you listen to that small talk, all the bullshit that you and I just don't have time for, right? Like the news and the whatever, yeah. um, the house of weather talk and all that shit. If you spend so much time focusing on that, you never get to that point. But if you're mentally um, confident, not even strong, but if you're confident enough to get to that point, that's where you get, that's something that you earn. Like nobody can take that moment away from her. And I don't know what that felt like for her. Um, but she should be damn proud of herself to be able to get to that point And to the point where it's like, it's, it's an emotional response involuntarily just right away. Yeah. And, um, a lot of people never get that in their life. And those, I was listening to a podcast, um, on the way, I think it was, it was on the way home from Montreal. It was a Brent, Brent, uh, Brent Fikowski was on the Brute Strength podcast and he was talking about how, um, in the China CrossFit championships, how we didn't do any of the touristy stuff. And this was the, the comparison is bang on. So I'm going to use it because I don't really know how to verbalize, uh, what Kayla did because she hasn't explained it to me yet. It's still, I think it's still like <laughs> what just happened sort of deal. But Brent's thing was he sees all these other athletes that are at the competition and they're doing the touristy things. And it's like, well, I'm over here. So I might as well have that experience. He worded it perfectly. He said, anyone with enough time and money could experience those things. Anyone with enough time and money could go to Disneyland in China. They can go to the Great Wall of China. They can go wherever. Pick a place. You can go if you have enough time and money. But nobody will have the same feeling that he had winning that competition because he's the only one that did it. Those, those are the things that like nobody can take away from you and only you experience. And those are the special experiences that sport can bring people. And that's why I think that everyone should be involved in sport in some way, shape, or form or at least find something that you're passionate about if it's not sports so that you can experience those things. Because to me, that's what life's all about. Those little moments, those are the things that you don't forget. You're not going to remember standing on the Great Wall of China. Like those, maybe if you took a picture, I don't know, that just sits on your yeah. phone and it's like 5,000 photos into your video camera album thing. And it's like, you never even look at it again. Nobody can imitate that feeling. Nobody's going to feel that other than you. There's little moments that you can't get anywhere else. That's yeah. Well said. I don't even have much to add to that. <laughs> that was it. I, I can just tell you that there's, there's like select, select moments. There's a lot of them, but some stick out more than others in my past from playing hockey that I can still like beyond vividly remember. Yeah. I mean, I, there'd be certain games that I could name to you and I could still tell you like, 
where exactly every single teammate in the room is sitting like, and I can still, and it's not like someone who goes through the ranks playing hockey. Like it's not like you play with the same guys for 15, 20 years. Like you probably play with the hundreds right. of different yeah. guys, yeah. but still you just, you remember that so vividly that, I could still remember that team that year, what players were sitting where exact stall in the same room. And it's, it's for the reasons that you just said, like, mm -hmm. cause you're with those guys like day in, day out, putting in constant work and effort, boring stuff, hard work, big <clears throat> skates, whatever you name it right. day in and day out. And you're all working to that exact same common goal. So yeah. when you get to that goal or even when you get close to that goal and you can start to smell it, like you said, that's, those are the experiences that you cherish and those are the ones that you'll never, ever forget. Right. So, and yeah. yeah, I think like you said, you said it perfectly, like something that you're beyond passionate about and stick to it and follow it. Yeah. Yeah. Actually fall through with it and don't, don't let things like take you off of that path. Like if it's something that you want to do, just you, you have to make it happen. There's a million different reasons why it's not going to happen. Um, but if you can find one that it should, or it can, then you got to do it. And mm -hmm. like you mentioned, it's, it's the effort. You remember the guys that were working beside you just as hard as you were in order to accomplish something that was special that nobody else is going to have the same experience. That's yeah. something that you can't buy. You can't purchase that. You can't, you just can't imitate it. Yeah. And I mean, just in closing, I think that's one of the cool things with CrossFit classes is yeah, that you, totally. you, when you go through this it doesn't even have to be the same people but often it ends up being that way anyway anyways when you go yep. through you know a 20 minute amrap or whatever with the same group of people over and over again that's i mean that's why you develop some of those ties and bonds right yeah that's why it's that's why it's so cool that's why <clears throat> that's why you can't really explain it to people until they actually go that's right yeah you get a group of people clapping for somebody and cheering for somebody you got yeah, the first bar muscle cool. up and patting them on the back or somebody's you know showing consistency in your uh, when you come back from a layoff, you're like, oh, man, we missed you and stuff yeah. like that. Like all those little moments, those are things that yeah. you can't get anywhere else. But it makes it special. I'm done. That's, I got nothing. <laughs> that's it. I'm so sweaty. <laughs> yeah. This is it. Muggy today. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't matter anyways. It's always sweaty. It's so sweaty all the time. Get stressed out talking to this <laughs> mic. <laughs> yeah. All right, kids. Go do something that gets you all excited and makes you want to cry today. That's right. Amen. And we'll see you next week. <laughs>